Welcome to the Spot On Insurance Podcast, brought to you by Insurance Licensing Services of America, ILSA. This is Arlene Tavares. And this is Ted Tavares, coming to you from Puerto Rico. In this episode, we'll be getting insight from one of the top regulatory attorneys in our industry. But before we begin, remember to click on the subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode. And now here's our host, Doug Foresta. Hello and welcome. This is Doug Foresta, your host. With me today is Zane Gilmer. He is a partner at Stinson Leonard Street. And we're going to be talking today about, I think, a a really interesting uh, topic and and one that's uh, very timely, which is about marijuana and insurance and the legal implications and implications in general about uh, marijuana laws. Uh, Zane Gilmer, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Can we first talk about some of the Start with this idea of the the federal and state marijuana law dichotomy. Uh, can you say a little bit about what that dichotomy is between the federal and state laws when it comes to marijuana? Yeah, absolutely. That's a, it's a great place to start because it, it really drives the foundation for um, where the issues lie and, and why we really even have to talk about this. Um, so just a little bit of background. Currently, we have 29 states in the District of Columbia that permit some form of legalized marijuana. Uh, eight of those 29 states permit medical and recreational marijuana. Uh, so the vast majority of them are, are medical only, uh, but uh, the number of recreational states is growing in, in numbers, uh, especially over this last election, California being the most notable state to legalized recreational marijuana. Um, the, the rub here is really that federal law under the Controlled Substances Act still prohibits the cultivation, possession, and distribution of marijuana. And so with that prohibition, you end up with an intersection of, um, uh, of differences between state and federal law, and that creates a whole host of problems for every industry, not just the insurance industry, which we'll talk about today, but uh, every industry that interacts in some way, shape, or form with the marijuana industry. Mm. Uh, it also triggers a whole host of other federal laws that come into play, not just the Controlled Substances Act, but uh, it also implicates aiding and abetting issues, uh, conspiracy, federal money laundering issues, civil and criminal forfeiture, to name a few. And uh, there, there have just been a host of these issues that continue to pop up. And uh, to further complicate, I think, matters in Early 2014, in February of that year, uh, the Department of Justice issued some guidance, uh, its second uh, official guidance called the Cole Memo, uh, in which it sort of laid out enforcement priorities related to marijuana. And the reason it did it is in recognition of all these states starting to go live with uh, medical marijuana, they recognize that they can't, uh, they don't have the resources in the Department of Justice to enforce every violation of the Controlled Substances Act that's happening at the state level. And so they issue this guidance that reaffirms that it's still illegal, but that they're going to focus on the violation of the various enforcement priorities and and really use their resources there. Interestingly, though, uh, later that year, uh, late that year during the congressional funding cycle, uh, Congress, in, in appropriating funds to the Department of Justice, limited the Department of Justice's ability to use the funds appropriated to it uh, in going after or interfering with state medical marijuana laws. That uh, funding appropriation limitation has been carried over uh, throughout the years and and is still active today in the current funding cycle that I believe ends in, in September of this year. But it's an important limitation because courts have upheld that limitation in terms of the Department of Justice not being able to go after marijuana actors that are in compliance with state law. Uh, they can't use their funds for doing that, but it doesn't apply to the recreational marijuana. And so there's an important uh. sort of distinction there, but it, it sort of puts the whole picture together as to the where we're going to talk about more, you know, drill down into some of the insurance issues today, that there are a lot of issues here uh, and a lot of angles that you can look at it, and I often refer to it as uh, an onion and, and peeling back the layers of the onion. You address one issue, and as you peel that off the onion, it just exposes another layer of issues, and you're just continuously sort of dealing with another wrench uh, that is, quite frankly, unlike any 
uh, other area of law that I've really ever dealt with. Well, let's let's peel some more of that onion. I think that's a that is a great metaphor for this and a great way to understand it. How about property and looking at starting with property and casualty insurance issues with marijuana? What are some of the the issues that would come up with property and casualty insurance related to the marijuana industry? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's really an evolving area. Uh, we we've seen several cases uh, across the country that have addressed this issue. And I really put it into a couple of buckets. I mean, we'll talk about a couple of these cases uh, as we go through this, but mm-hmm. I try to break out um, when I explain to folks the, on the property and casualty side, the, the two buckets. One, one is for, for those insurance companies that want to provide insurance uh, to uh, the industry, and then those insurance companies that don't want to provide uh, coverage uh, of any kind to the industry. And although they have similar issues that we'll talk about, I think it's important to sort of put yourself in, in one of those respective buckets. And, and for right. those that don't want to provide coverage, uh, you really need to, based on the cases that have come up, uh, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about a couple of them here in a second, but you really have to be specific a, a, about excluding that type of coverage for the activity. Uh, and so when you're, when you're doing that, it's, as part of putting either a rider in or specific language in the policy itself, that it's very clear that you're not going to cover marijuana related activity, but it's got to be more specific than that. Perhaps, uh, you know, you got to consider what aren't you covering related to that activity? Are you can covering uh, marijuana related equipment like grow lights, irrigation systems that aren't really inherently marijuana related uh, uh, paraphernalia, but uh, obviously help, uh, produce the marijuana. One of the first cases that came up was out of Hawaii uh, called Tracy B. Uh, USAA Casualty Insurance Company back in 2012. And, and there, the insurance company didn't have a specific provision excluding or uh, including coverage for marijuana plants, but a medical marijuana patient uh, who happened to be the insured under that policy uh, made a claim because uh, multiple of her plants were stolen. And so she argued under the general trees, shrubs, and other plants provision uh, in the policy that these cons- that these marijuana plants... That was co- it was covered. Of, uh, right, that it was covered. Right. And so you, you should be able to, to, to get coverage for that. Uh, ultimately, the, the court said uh, that, the, the, that doing so would, would violate public policy because there's still this issue with federal law. But I, I point it out because it's important to note that if this happens in a different jurisdiction or with a different judge, that outcome could, could be different because there's potentially some ambiguity as to whether or not uh, a plant is a marijuana plant and it's covered. Uh, the easy fix here, of course, is just to say that you're not going to cover those types of things. And so really the key takeaway there is to, to make sure that you're not covering that type of, that you're, you're, you're specifically excluding those, that coverage. You also need to consider not just the direct coverage issues of plants and, and gr- the, the actual grow operation itself, but think about uh, losses that can occur because of marijuana activity. And so here there's a great case out of the Sixth Circuit that ar- arose out of Michigan, uh, Nationwide Mutual Fire Insurance Company versus uh, McDermott. And in that case, there were co-insureds that had a house and the, the husband who was the co- one of the co-insureds had a medical marijuana operation in the basement, and he was going through a process called butane extraction, where he was using butane and fire to extract uh, levels of THC out of the marijuana plants. Mm. Uh, and, you know, it creates higher level potency, and, and then he would turn around and sell it. And he he was licensed under Michigan law to engage in, in that activity. Well, the butane extraction process caused an explosion and burnt down the house. And so the the wife, who was also a co-insured, made a claim under the policy for the, the coverage to the house. And the insurance company argued uh, against coverage for a number of reasons, including that it vi- would violate public policy, as in the, the Tracy case from Hawaii. Uh, but, the, but ultimately, the court denied coverage uh, based on language that the insured was supposed to notify the insurance company of any activity that changed at the residence that could increase the risk of exposure to uh, the property. And so the insurance company kind of kind of cut a break there 
based on some some language there because they didn't notify the insurance company of this marijuana activity. Uh, but again, I think it's a lesson that you got to think beyond the plant issue and could the activity that's going on cause uh, a, a loss or a claim under the policy? And how are you going to deal with that from a, a contract and policy drafting perspective so that you don't have to worry about litigation and figuring out what a court's going to do and, and if they're going to save you on some language uh, like like they did in the, the, the McDermott case. So that's an so important distinction. Cases- that's an important distinction, I think, because I, I think what you know, one of the things I just want to point out is really what we're talking about today has relevance for all insurers, it, you know, because it's not enough to say what I hear you saying is you can't really say, well, you know, I'm not going to deal. Uh, we're just not going to deal with marijuana. If you don't want to if you don't want to be taking out policies. Uh, on marijuana and marijuana related things, then it sounds like what you're saying is you have to be really careful about the language that you that you have in your contracts. Right. It's it's not just as easy as putting in there that we don't cover marijuana plants or or marijuana activity, right? Because mm-hmm. this case is a prime example of yeah. the the lost coverage issue was about the house, not the marijuana activity, but the marijuana activity caused the loss. Mm. And, you know, the court bailed the insurance company out a little bit by relying on a notification provision of the risk exposure uh, issue in in the policy. But that could easily go a different way. It's all resolved if you're if you're just careful about how you draft these things. Think about how these losses could occur uh, directly or indirectly and and make sure that you're covering yourself there in in a in a broad yet specific way. That's great. You don't have to litigate about it. Yeah. Uh, and figure out at the end of the day whether I have a covered box. Yeah. Um, so the other flip side, the other bucket, of course, is those insurance companies who want to provide coverage. And and, and the same sort of risk factors and, and considerations apply here, where if you're going to cover it, what are you covering? If you're going to cover uh, the marijuana equipment, be specific about what you're covering. If you're going to cover the plants or the seeds or the inventory, you got you got to know that there's a difference between those types of things, just like any other industry that insurance companies operate in, there's industry specific terminology and and that terminology could determine whether or not a certain type of plant or a certain phase uh, or category of a plant would potentially be covered by the language of the policy. And so if you're planning to cover part of it, but you don't want to cover other parts of it, you need to know the industry, you need to understand the terminology so that you can effectively draft your policies uh, that cover the risk that you intend to and exclude the risks that you're not intending to cover. And a prime example of this, frankly, is uh, uh, a recent case out of the District of Colorado just uh, late last year. The issue was really, there was a multiple factor uh, factors at play here, but the, the case was the Green Earth uh, Wellness Center v. Attain Specialty Insurance Company. And the insured that had a marijuana operation made a claim for damage to marijuana plants and inventory from a nearby wildfire. The smoke penetrated the ventilation system and then uh, damaged the, the plants. Uh, and so they made a claim. There was evidence that the insurance company knew that this was a grow operation from the outset and entered into this policy. And, uh, and so they made a claim and it really came down to ultimately the court looking at the contract terms and determining, you know, sort of construing what was covered and what wasn't. And there are very specific language in there, but the, the issues had to do with whether there were, you know, quote, mothering plants or there were flowering plants, okay. uh, veg plants, clones, finished product, inventory. And so there's all these technical terms that are industry specific that the court had to determine whether or not certain pieces of this actually fit within the policy. And at the end of the day, the uh, insurance company also tried to invalidate the policy by arguing that even if all of these technical termed categories of plants were covered by the policy, that it shouldn't be enforced because of the public policy argument, again, back, going back to the Tracy and right. Hawaii case. And the the court wasn't buying it. It said, look, you knew that you were getting into this marijuana policy and you you know you you shouldn't have done it if you didn't want to uh actually cover these things you were taking premiums on a monthly basis you made a contract uh and i'm not in, i'm not making you pay for lost marijuana plants if i found that you breached the contract it's just 
uh, damages related to a breach of contract. And so basically, I, I, as the judge, don't have a problem enforcing this contract against you, given the circumstances. And so it ultimately ended up settling out of court after the court denied the insurance company's attempts to, to get around the policy. But this is another example of where you have to be specific if you are going to cover things. And again, if you're not, what does it mean? Know your industry, know what you're covering, uh, know what, what the terms are, and, and be specific. Um, the other piece of this that I will suggest on that note is uh, when you have your producers out there, just like you do with a lot of other industries, have a questionnaire that these folks fill out that uh, explain what their business is, explain the types of, of plants or the inventory or the merchandise or uh, the equipment or whatever it is that they're intending to cover and and really understand what that is so that you can vet it and uh, draft the policy accordingly. Spot on Insurance is sponsored by ILSA, Insurance Licensing Services of America, America's premier licensing and regulatory compliance experts. To learn more about ILSA and the services they provide, visit ilsainc.com. Let's talk about as well, let's shift gears a moment and talk about health insurance coverage and, and medical marijuana. And can you talk about, I know you have some cases to share with us about that, but can you just say a little bit first about what some of those considerations are uh, for health insurance coverage and, and medical marijuana? Yeah, so there, really what's developing is the, you know, of course, medical marijuana for folks who don't, if, who don't know is, is regulated. Uh, it, it varies by state, but it's a state law issue. And the, the process for uh, obtaining medical marijuana uh, varies by state according to those state-specific regulations. Uh, but generally, there's a process where folks have to go through uh, some sort of physician-related um, uh, presentation where they are prescribed medical marijuana for whatever ailment they have. And then they uh, have access to, in, 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 in Colorado, it's a marijuana card, a red card, and then uh, they have access to the medical marijuana facilities around town. Uh, you know, that's sort of the broad swath way that it works. Um, and, but you have to go through the process to get, you know, you have to have the, the, the medical ailment and then, you know, have a physician say that this would actually treat that ailment. And so that's kind of how medical marijuana works, where it really comes up in the insurance context, uh, at least recently, and where we've seen these cases go is in the workers comp, uh, section where you have a worker who gets hurt, makes a claim under the workers comp policy in the process of seeing a workers comp physician and the workers comp physician either on their own or at the request of the the patient asks for a prescription for medical marijuana and then the question becomes whether or not the insurance company has to cover the in the medical marijuana under the policy um, if it's been prescribed by a physician right and so that's kind of the context in which uh, these issues generally arise uh, under state law. We, we have seen a couple of cases that that have come up related to this topic. One uh, was an administrative law judge uh, earlier this year out of New Jersey. And the judge ruled in that case, uh, which was a workers' comp case, that the worker was entitled to seek reimbursement for the medical marijuana uh, needed to treat uh, the specific medical conditions that they had. That is a similar holding as uh, the New Mexico Court of Appeals made back in 2015. There was a worker who suffered a, a compensable injury uh, in the course of their employment, and the worker went to the physician. The physician uh, essentially prescribed a bunch of different things for the, the worker, including medical marijuana as being reasonably and necessary for uh, the medical care for the, the worker. And they ended up having a fight with the insurance company about whether or not the insurance company would have to cover that uh, medical marijuana. And ultimately, the New Mexico Court of Appeals held that uh, because the physician found that medical marijuana was reasonable and necessary for the treatment of that ailment, that uh, it was compensable. And so uh, be aware that these are out there and um, that this is starting to be, I wouldn't call it yet a trend, but they're definitely starting to arise in various situations. 
there are there there's a caveat to this that there are some states um, like Colorado, for instance, that specifically have a statute or some other law that is coupled with the medical marijuana laws Mm -hmm. that says just because we've passed medical marijuana, it does not mean that those laws should be construed as requiring insurance companies to cover medical marijuana. And so I suspect that uh, the cases that I just mentioned out of New Jersey and uh, New Mexico may have turned out differently if they were in a state like Colorado, because we have a statute that, at least on its face, uh, purports to protect insurance companies from the inadvertent coverage of medical marijuana. Well, you know, we've talked about the the peeling of the onion here, and the uh, the last one that the last part of the onion that I that I want to uh, unravel here today is the considerations for businesses that are ancillary businesses, uh, marijuana related, but also things that we might not think of as being related to marijuana. Can you explain first sure. of all what some of those ancillary businesses might be? Absolutely. So think about marijuana, the marijuana industry as any other industry, and specifically those marijuana companies as any other company from any other industry that may need services, right? So uh, it could be a vendor for consulting that provides expert consulting services to the the industry, Uh, you know, growing techniques. It could be uh, HR related services, so human resources or payroll folks who are out, you know, they have their own separate company. They're not marijuana related, but they do all of the services for the marijuana industry. It's manufacturers who uh, manufacture packaging materials for the marijuana industry in, you know, so that the marijuana can be packaged and then sold at the store. It's the strip mall unit that, uh, you know, the, the landlord or real estate owner who leases out the uh, a unit to a marijuana pot shop uh, or a warehouse that's leased to a grow operation. And so there are a ton of these different ancillary businesses that exist whole or in part to serve the marijuana industry. And within each of these, you know, there are Uh, We've seen the proliferation of these types of industries in Colorado where you have existing companies that uh, historically operated and and served other industries, but now the marijuana industry has come into play. And so they may provide a little bit of service to the marijuana industry. And then there are other industries that have popped up solely to serve the marijuana industry. And so 100% of their revenue may come from the marijuana industry. Uh, And so those are some of the examples of things that are popping up to, to help serve the marijuana industry. And as it relates to insurance specifically, uh, these become important because, again, it's understanding the industry so that when you're writing insurance policies, that you understand the risk that you're actually undertaking and that you're not, you're not permitting things or accepting risks that you didn't intend to. And likewise, if you do intend to, that you're, everybody's on the same page, the, the strip mall and the warehouse examples are, are are decent examples because if you provide insurance for the landlord uh, for the entire strip mall, for instance, and again, you have a pot shop that's in one of the, let's say, five units there and an event happens uh, because of the marijuana operation that burns down the entire strip mall, is your policy going to exclude coverage for that? Because the, the landlord, your insured, is probably going to argue that they want a covered loss here. And and so understand that these things happen and that there are these uh, ancillary issues that touch you that you need to be aware of. And again, it's just sort of know your business, know your insurers and, and know what they're doing so that you can um, uh, limit the risk appropriately. My guest today has been Zane Gilmer, partner at Stinson Leonard Street. Uh, Zane, I definitely think that I, I can picture a lot of our listeners uh, going back and looking over their policies <laughs> after after listening to this episode, which from what you, everything you've said, I think would be a good thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. Make sure uh, that you don't bury your head in the sand. Uh, it's a real thing. It's out there. So, uh, you know, if you know about it, you can manage it. And I want to make sure if people want to reach you or they want to learn more about Stinson Leonard Street, what's the best way for them to do that? They can give me a call at 303-376-8416. They can also email me at zane.gilmer at stenson.com, or they can find me on LinkedIn. Zane Gilmer, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. 
Direct your podcast questions to iask at soyteam.com. Share this podcast with your friends. And remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode.